Joining me now to discuss the role of foreign policy in uh, U.S. presidential politics is Steve Clemens. He is the Washington editor-at-large for The Atlantic magazine. Steve, thanks for joining us. And Great to be with you. To the heat. Uh, let's start off with the election. President Obama has been re-elected. He is going to be president for another four years. How much of a role did foreign policy play in his re-election? It was a minor role because most Americans were focused on their economic situation. But as we've seen in nearly every election, an incident can happen. Almost a spike of interest has happened in Libya, uh, in part because of the killing uh, of Ambassador Christopher Stevens in Benghazi and it raised important questions about the security of embassies and what our strategy is in the Middle East, North Africa region, which uh, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama um, essentially challenged each other over. So there was a lot of drama, a lot of interest, but I, that doesn't classify as being a deep interest of the American uh, uh, citizens in foreign policy. Well, if we look a bit more broadly, when we look at how the president exercises power, we find that he has a lot more leeway in foreign policy rather than domestic policy, where he faces, I would imagine, more formidable obstacles in terms of what Congress can do, the checks and balances there, as well as public opinion itself. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's a very fair assessment in part because there are 535 members of Congress, so the Senate and House, who essentially either want to be president or want to be secretary of state. They all have their own view of how the world should run because it's easy to have views about the rest of the world because you don't have constituents pounding on your door uh, over this interest or that. And so to a certain degree, the president gets latitude in foreign policy more than domestic affairs because there's less of a domestic constituency that is really what American politics uh, plays to. Great point. Let's look at an example. Over the past 10 years, and I'm just a hypothetical situation, who has been impacted more by the U.S. president's policies? A taxi driver in Baghdad or a taxi driver in Chicago? Oh, oh clearly, I think a uh, taxi driver in Baghdad. I, I think both the, um, you know, there's this, this uh, phrase in America that you can you can hug so much that it hurts. Uh, America's attention in Afghanistan has driven lots and lots of lots of money into a very poor economy. And now as Afghan citizens are both looking at the, the question of, of withdrawal of US forces and attention, it's not just security that's an issue, it's money. I mean we were pumping 120 billion dollars a year into a nation that had a 14 billion dollar GDP. So clearly the uh, Afghan cab driver is impacted because we have no such attention going to Chicago. Okay. Uh, would it be accurate to say that a president can pretty much chart his own foreign policy course in many respects without much interference, say, from the Republicans, for that matter, or from Congress? Uh, the sole exception to this being Israel. <laughs> well, I, I, Israel, you know, Brent Scowcroft, who is, a, uh, I think, a very, very good national security advisor, uh, once said to me that in matters of Cuba and matters of Israel, the, the way those are managed are completely different because they're really domestic political issues. They're the two nations that have such a deep political support base in the United States that they don't fit the tradition, uh, traditional strategic roadmap. But I think everywhere else, you're, you're pretty much right with the exception of war and peace because constitutionally, even though it's debated, Congress has the right to declare war. Not has the, that been the case in practice, though? In, in, in practice, I would say no, it hasn't. Yeah. But nonetheless, uh, it is Congress that when they pass the Iraq War Resolution or a resolution right. about uh, this that enables the executive branch of our government, the presidency, to have almost unlimited powers to create a continual warfare over what was called terrorism and, and continually linking it as one seamless piece. I'm very much opposed to those kinds of resolutions. Congress gave that executive authority uh, and empowered the president to do that. And so there is a play here. It is controversial, and I think it would be a mistake to think that Congress is out of the picture. It's just the weaker part of that equation. That's right, actually. If we look at uh, you know, the foreign policy preoccupation or the focus over the last 10 years, it's been largely on what has become known as the war on terror, uh, specifically the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq as well. Right. Uh, how does that change in the next 10 years? Well, right now it's not changing. What's interesting is President Obama came into office four years ago saying he was going to change that equation. He was going to move back. But look, we have a U.S. president that is uh, engaged in, you know, every morning at, at uh, before 9 a.m. He sits down with his national security advisors and they go through which people they're going to kill with drones. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an essentially an extraterritorial authority uh, to, to work across lots of platforms, not just in Pakistan or Afghanistan. We've seen drone attacks in the Philippines. Uh, and other places. And so I think that you've got a president who says many things that about governance and whatnot, but we still have a president who's very much fighting a kinetic, 
hot war without a lot of oversight uh, from the U.S. Congress uh, around there. So I don't suspect, sadly, that that is going to change much in the next four years. And I suspect that if a Hillary Clinton or a Jeb Bush, whoever will be uh, the president following uh, President Obama, is, it, you know, we have a reality here which is very tough. When the president usurps or takes powers mm -hmm. and embeds it, they give those powers up very, very grudgingly and very rarely. And so it's hard to see a course where that kind of behavior or posture will quickly change. I think Americans will have to have a, uh, an introspective discussion about strategy and their place in the right. world and call for something different. But I don't see that happening. Right, great point, because here we have a situation where the president has appropriated to himself the power to decide, as you point out at that morning meeting, who he's going to kill with drones, or in some instances, who he's going to execute. And that could be an American citizen as well. That's right, and, and I, I'm appalled by it, and I find it something, but there are not a lot of Americans that are paying attention to it. But you can see how important it is, because President Obama considered what would happen if he lost the election. And he began trying to put into place the mechanics of a process by which this review of drone targeting would occur on a more systematic basis. So it wouldn't just be vulnerable to a man or woman coming in as president and continuing a highly subjective process. In other words, he's admitting it's a highly subjective process, not subjected to uh, a very sophisticated set of disciplines. No check and, and, and balance. And, and I'm, I'm saying we should be worried about that. But, but look, uh, we live in complicated, messy times. I'm, I'm someone who worries about the routinization, making a routine out of things that ought to be extraordinary, if ever, uh, occur. But when it comes to deploying power, um, President Obama, as a Democrat, has shown, has broken, you know, the, the fear that I think many, many had about Democrats, saying that the Democrats, after the Vietnam War, could no longer deploy power, could no longer deploy force in pursuit of national interests of the United States. That's clearly not the case with President Obama. And I think he's changed the mold for right. everyone who comes but after. Is he, is he overcompensating for that perception of the Democrat Party? You know, we've often heard that the Democrat Party is always weak on security. Uh, is he saying, well, I'm going to prove the other now? He has proved the other. What he's been uh, able to show is that he can deploy uh, Navy SEAL teams against pirates. Right. Uh, he can kill bin Laden. What he's not been able to do thus far is to create great strategic leaps in strategy. We've not been able to get a different course between the United States and Iran. We have an up and down course with our great power relations with China around the world. They're not horrible, but they're also not great. Where Obama has excelled is making Americans feel as if the United States is deploying power and keeping them safe by killing bad guys in the world. And that's a different kind of, of muscle in foreign affairs that the White House is showing. Okay, I wanna to move to something else right now, and that is something that we've been hearing about a lot over the past few months, and that is the so-called Asian pivot, this focus, yeah. or renewed focus, I should say, uh, on Asia and, and the Pacific. I mean, there's still a great deal of unfinished business in the Middle East. Why has the United States now decided, well, you know what, Asia's gonna be the focus It's, right it's now. very, very simple. When you look at what is going to happen in the next 50 years, and you see where wealth in the world is going to be created, when you look at the share of the global middle class, uh, and where it's going to be. China, India, Southeast Asia are going to grow dramatically in terms of where the global middle class uh, is. And those are the buyers, the consumers, and, and, and that, that will be the place where new rules are being made. And America is re, you know, rediscovering its Pacific DNA, that in fact that uh, it sees its own economic welfare and future there. When you look at the Middle East, important, important subjects, but it's not worth the blood and treasure that the United States has been resourcing into these wars uh, that have been undermining American power and America's choices. So when President Obama came into office, and I think from the very moment he began running, he said, you know, we are throwing too many resources mm -hmm. into a part of the world that is too distant from America's uh, economic future and what, what, what we need to continue to survive and thrive right. as a great political economy. So he, it's not that we're going to completely withdraw from the Middle East, but we've over-resourced it. And so he's trying to basically draw down resources and attention and forget budgets and forget how many Navy ships we have. When you look at the number of ministers, if you look at the trips that Obama and Hillary Clinton have made to the region, Leon Panetta and other cabinet secretaries inside his government, there's a huge shift from the Bush administration, which really sent very few people. Bob Zellick 
uh, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative and the Deputy Secretary of State was constantly in China and Asia. No one else was. And so there's been a very, very big shift that President Obama has been moving more and more attention and resources to Asia. And I look at it as a smart move. Right. How important is it for a U.S. President to get international consensus on major foreign policy decisions like invading a country? Well, that's a very important and interesting and, and problematic question. Uh, President Bush and his Vice President Dick Cheney didn't think it was that important to get a, a major international consensus, and they launched what they called the Coalition of the Willing, which right. meant you know those that you could occasionally assemble to do things. Obama has, particularly when we saw in the Libya intervention, took it much more seriously that he had uh, the Arab League vote and that he had a an instrument from the United Nations that was largely supporting. Uh, the move, at least abstaining, if not objecting to that. And when I interviewed various members of the national security team after the Libya inv invasion, they said for Obama this was a critical issue, that there would not have been an intervention if Susan Rice, our ambassador to the UN, and Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of State, had not secured that support. So I think it's important because America, to a certain degree, is a sa as a superpower, there's a mystique about American superpower status. And when you show your limits, if you show that much of the world is opposed to you, if you're constantly deploying force and military issues, that mystique is shattered somewhat. So part of the way in which the United States reminds the world that it can be a good, mostly benign sculptor of global affairs is having international support for what it does. So I look at it as a vital piece of it, but there are many presidents out there who, you know, people who want to be presidents who completely disagree and think that America should walk unshackled and unconcerned about the way the rest of the world looks about U.S. foreign policy moves. Steve Clements, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, and good to see you.